Thank you, Linda, for the beautiful arrangement that reminds us of those who perished on 9-11. If you can and are able, please join me in our call to worship that's printed in the bulletin. Please stand if you're able. Crowds gathered to hear Jesus speak of pain. Crowds gathered to hear Jesus speak of joy. We gather to hear Jesus speak words of truth, words of power, words of love. Speak now, O Lord, for your servants are
Let us pray. Gracious God, when our spirits lift at the beauty of the day, you are Lord. And when chaos threatens to overwhelm and we dread the next news cycle, still, you are Lord. Always you are creating, redeeming, sustaining. Speak then your mercy into this place until we discover the courage to open our eyes, unclench our hands, and move toward our neighbor in need until all the world rises and moves with the rhythm of your grace. For we long to honor the name of Jesus, who leads us into life. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Sisters and brothers, there is joy in the presence of the angel of God every time we turn toward our home and remember whose we are. With open hearts, let us pray. Create in sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ came into the world to save sinners. Believe the gospel. In Jesus Christ we are redeemed.
each of us go in silence to God with our own private prayers and communication. Open us, eternal God, to your word, read and proclaimed. Help us not to turn from your truth or avoid and distract ourselves from your message. Help us be receptive to the wisdom you offer. Amen. Our Old Testament reading today is from the prophet Jeremiah, the fourth chapter uh, beginning at the 11th verse and then resuming again at the 22nd verse. Let us listen for what God is saying to us in these words. At that time it shall be said to these, this people and to Jerusalem, a hot wind comes from me out of the bare heights in the desert toward my poor people, not to winnow and cleanse, a wind too strong for that. For it is I who speak in judgment against them. And then continuing at verse 22. For my people are foolish. They do not know me. They are stupid children. They have no understanding. They are skilled in doing evil, but do not know how to do good. I looked on the earth, and lo, it was waste and void, and to the heavens, and they had no light. I looked on the mountains, and lo, they were quaking, and all the hills moved to and fro. I looked, and lo, there was no one at all, and all the birds of the air had fled. I looked, and lo, the fruitful land was a desert, and all its cities were laid in ruins before the Lord, before his fierce anger. For thus says the Lord, the whole land shall be a desolation, yet I will not make a full end. Because of this, the earth shall mourn and the heavens above grow black. For I have spoken, I have purposed, I have not relented, nor will I turn back. Uh, and Today, I did change the order of worship uh, late in the week. Uh, poor Jackie had to put up with that. Uh, I got the correct New Testament scripture to her, but not the correct title of the sermon. Uh, the sermon is not lost and found. It is Christ came to save sinners. Uh, the title would not go with what I'm going to say in a little bit. Okay, well, anyway, our New Testament lesson comes from the first letter to Timothy, chapter 1, beginning at verse 12. Now, throughout this letter, Paul is writing to a favorite and most loved disciple, Timothy. We have two of these letters in the New Testament. The general focus of this first letter is to provide guidance for a Christian community in transition. The letter offers advice on church administration, pastoral and worship leadership, and how to oppose false teachers. All of these were issues for the emerging church, struggling with how to organize itself. But our text for today uh, is from the opening chapter of this uh, letter, and it is highly autobiographical um, for Paul, which he presents himself and his own life as an example 
of the central claim of the gospel. So let us hear the word of God. I am grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason, I received mercy, so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Twenty-one years ago, can it really be twenty-one years? It's twenty-one years ago, on the Sunday following September 11th, pastors across this nation climbed into the pulpit on that Sunday morning, and most were at a loss. What to say to the members and the visitors filling the sanctuary, looking for a word from the Lord? Well, that's the same question that perplexed me this week. What is the word of the Lord to us today as we gather in this sanctuary 21 years after that fateful day. Often we say that September 11, 2001 was a day that changed the world. In many ways that's true. Because of that day, our nation now has a Department of Homeland Security and a Patriot Act something that was never considered to be necessary before. Airline traveling is a bit more challenging, hmm, with increased security and body scans, and if you come in a wheelchair, they are going to check you out. We know that, don't we, Lawrence? (laughs) Uh, Your personal liquids and Toiletries are reduced to what can fit in those little tiny bottles. There are longer uh, wait times and higher fares. As a country, we fought two wars as a result of that day. And we continue a seemingly endless war on terror, both at home and abroad. More than 6,600 American servicemen and women lost their lives in those wars. More than double the number of civilians who died in the attacks that uh, day, uh, 21 years ago. But even more than that, the collective spirit of our nation seems to have changed. We seem to be more skeptical, more combative, less willing to compromise, more willing to celebrate the death of our enemies, and more fearful even of our neighbors in Simpsonville. The 21st anniversary of the September 11th attack has awakened emotions long buried. Some have felt that passionate anger again. Others have wept. 
Some know a renewed fear of attack. So yes, the world is different today. So on a day like today, we remember. It's hard not to remember a day like this one. We remember who we were with, where we were, and what we were doing. I was in my final year of teaching. Third grade teachers like me across Gaston County were administering the test of cognitive skills, a test designed to give a better understanding of a child's ability to succeed in school. So I knew nothing of the events until long after they had happened to when the test was completed. The principal sent written notes to all staff and faculty telling us to do everything possible to shield the students from knowing what was going on. Well, I began the next morning by gathering all of my, my students, my kids, they were my kids, around me, and I tried to allay their fears. I suspect that every one of us in this sanctuary can remember that day and the thoughts and the emotions that you experienced. But Saying that all Americans remember that day is a statement that is becoming more and more inaccurate because we now have a whole generation of people who were too young to remember that day or who were not even born yet. Scary, isn't it? And that is at least part of why I believe our reading from First Timothy this morning speaks God's word to us on a day like today. As one commenter, uh, commentator said, this is a letter from a mentor to a cherished mentee, from a father figure to a son of the heart, from an older pastor at the brink of retirement to a young pastor just beginning ministry. This is a letter to those who had never heard the story, or who had heard the story, but who did not have direct knowledge of the event. And so before Paul gets into all the organization and ritual and protection and processes in the chapters ahead, he wants Timothy to know what is really at stake, what is most important to remember. That is why they would gather together in the first place. And this verse was it. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Now let me say that again so that you don't miss it. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That is the heart of the gospel. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Now Paul claims that he was the foremost sinner around. He was a blasphemer. He was a persecutor. He was a man of violence. In other places in his letters, he calls himself the least of the apostles. And he details his persecution of the fledgling Christian church. The writer of Acts certainly picks up on this depiction of Paul as a persecutor because we're told that those who stone Stephen put their coats at Paul's feet. And then Paul is on his way to Damascus, breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, when 
Jesus Christ encounters him on the road. It may be an exaggeration to say that Paul is the foremost sinner, the worst ever in the history of the world. But he certainly does not hide his transgressions against Christ and Christ's church. The message of the gospel is that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. If God can save Paul through Christ, then God can save anyone. God restores even Paul to the right relationship through Jesus Christ, not because he earned it, but because that's who God is. Paul's story and testimony here become merely an example of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. The foremost sinner has been turned into an unlikely saint. That is the spirit and truth that drew the first followers to Jesus and empowered Christian communities who first heard Paul preach. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That is good news that should enliven each of our faiths. That is good news. Good news that changes the world. For despite the tragedy that we experienced on September 11, 2001, despite the real and tangible fear that has marked our life together ever since, that is not the day that matters. The event that truly unites us was not a tax on the financial and military headquarters of our nation. The world has always focused on finances and military to define power and threat. September 11th was not any different in that regard except that it happened here. As Duke Divinity School professor Stanley Horowitz has written, September 11th, 2001 is not the day that changed our world. The world, the cosmos, what we call history was changed in A.D. 33. What truly unites us, what decisively changed the world, the cosmos, and history happened much before 2001. For on that day, Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, the creator and sustainer of the universe, was crucified on a cross. And on the third day, he rose again. We all stand united at the foot of the cross, for we all stand equally in need of Christ's amazing grace. Then we may lift our voices in praise beside the empty tomb, for our world is full of death. And one day, we know not when, Death comes for us all. But we also know death is not the end. For on that resurrection day, God changed the world. Christ is risen, and in him, death is no more. That's what Paul is testifying to in our scripture for today that this is what we need to teach and to pass on to our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. No matter what the world may tell you, no matter how fearful you may be, no matter if the mountains tremble in the heart of the sea, 
No matter if towers fall, the saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came to save sinners. We are the Lord's. He is our unity. He is our security. He is our hope. And He is why it is vital that we, as the church, remember this day. Together, we mourn those who lost their lives. Together, we celebrate the courage and selfless sacrifice of so many who sought to provide aid and rescue. Together, we join hands and pray for our nation and its leaders. Together, we give thanks for the blessings of freedom that we enjoy. Let there be no doubt that September 11, 2001, is the defining day for a generation. And as a defining day, it is the day on which we must proclaim the good news of the gospel. Just as the church proclaimed life in the midst of death on so many other defining days in the past, such as during the Great Depression, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, following the assassinations of JFK and Martin Luther King Jr., we proclaim the good news today, just as the church will proclaim the good news on days that will define our children and their children and their children. Today, we proclaim that Christ is risen and in him dead even the most tragic and generation-defining death will be no more. Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And now, having heard the word of the Lord, read and proclaimed, let us rise in body or in spirit as we are able and proclaim what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. We gather today, Creator God, by the prompting of your Spirit, drawn to this sanctuary by your will and your desire for us to worship together as a community. Each of us, connected as a family of faith, related by our common bond as children of yours, bring to worship our own burdens. Hear our petitions as we lift our prayers of personal concern, as well as those of our world, nation, and community. In your mercy, God of grace, hear our prayers for our world. We pray for the people of Ukraine, for the end of violence and the use of oppression as a way to control and coerce. We pray for peace and justice to be the rule of the land. We pray for the poor, the refugee, and the asylum seeker, for the hungry, the homeless, and the sick. 
in a world of such abundance, hear our prayers for a restructuring of economies and for jubilee debt relief so that all your people may flourish. In your mercy, God of peace, hear our prayers for our nation. We remember the pain and loss of September 11th today, every anniversary and occasion for prayer, every remembrance a living grief. We pray for the generations affected by this tragedy, those who still harbor the trauma of unspeakable violence, those still grieving the lives lost, we pray for the innocents who witness the violence humans can perpetrate one to another. Lord, have mercy on us. Turn us wholeheartedly to your path of peace. Floods continue to decimate homes and lives. Wildfires rage. Storms devastate. God, your creation is powerful and worthy of our respect. Help us to care for our planet as our precious home. Encourage our leaders toward initiatives that are environmentally just. Help us to help those, the poorest among us, who are most affected by our poor stewardship of natural resources. Help us all remember our responsibility to you, to each other, to our planet. United as a community of faith and as the body of Christ, we lift these prayers up to you, creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Hear us as we join our hearts and our voices in praying the prayer Christ taught us to pray by saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our God is a generous God. Let us give and live generously in response to all that God has done for us. Our tithes and offerings may be dropped in the collection plate at the back door.
Let us pray. Holy God, how often we take for granted all that we have. How often we fail to recognize how blessed we are. Take these gifts we give in response to your generosity and use them to further Christ's mission and ministry in a hurting world. Amen. As we go forth from this place, let us remember, wherever you go, God is sending you. Wherever you are, God has a purpose in your being there. Christ, who dwells within you, has something he wants to do through you. And Christ has given you the Holy Spirit to guide you, equip you, and sustain you along the way. Believe it and go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And now may the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the peace and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.